but it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Chapman, a fellow Lincoln graduate and has been farming for many years with his wife Anne on a high country property in Mid Canterbury. He has recently formed an equity partnership with his farm manager of 25 years, which is an incredible achievement, John. He states often that he is rehearsing retirement, to, and he is probably one of the most well-known speakers in the room today, so I don't think you'll be retiring anytime soon, I'm afraid, John. He's been instrumental in showcasing the role of legumes in a high country forage system, and today he is going to discuss the role legumes have played in his farm system in Vareri Station. Welcome, John. Thank you very much for that introduction. Just firstly, I want to acknowledge um, the part that Malcolm Smith, Dick Lucas, and Derek Moot have played in this work that we've done at home. I started off by, my, by myself and uh, gathering samples from 30 odd, 35 pasture cages and drying it in the oven at home. And I can tell you that's not a particularly good recipe for, for relationships with head office. So we're absolutely delighted when, when Derek Moot uh, learnt something of uh, what we were doing at home and joined us and gave us some support. So where is Inverary? It's uh, in the Ashburton Gorge. Mount Summers is the nearest township between. It's in the Ashburton Gorge is between the Rakaia and the Rangitata rivers. Those with long memories, some of you early settlers may recall being at a field day uh, with the corresponding Grassland Conference in Mid Canterbury about 15 or 20 years ago. So, some details about the property. It uh, carries 4,250 hectares, 7,500 sheep, 1,500 uh, cattle, and around 15,000 stock units. It uh, runs from 500 metres to 1,500 metres in old terms. That's about 1,600 uh, feet to about 4,600 feet. It's in 1,000 mil, quite a, quite a reasonable rainfall area. So let's look at some of the land classes uh, that are there. Um, about half the property is an extensive high country, around about 2,000 hectares, and that's not um, part of the talk today. About 600 hectares are now cultivated, and in between that, there are two blocks of 800 hectares, one of which is an improved hill, and I mean oversown top dress type improved hill, and unimproved hill, which is basically uh, um, the, the subject of the talk today. So I'm just going to flick through one or two slides to give you some idea of what the country's like. So this is some of our sort of higher altitude stuff uh, out the back, uh, mustering hut, and to the right and above uh, is running up to the highest point of the place on the Morehouse Range. This is winter. Uh, see some? It's, it's it's reasonably brisk in the winter. This is our uh, homestead area, you're looking across to Mount Summers and the Old Man Range and looking now at some of the paddocks at the bottom. And this is the sort of mid-altitude country um, that um, I'm basically going to be talking about today in this, uh, in this slide here. Just to remind you um, that it's quite a brisk climate. Um, this is mid-winter and we get this every few years. Uh, our findings uh, really have got uh, the most relevance to a lot of summer moist, high rainfall country through the South Island, less so for central Otago and North Canterbury, uh, Marlborough and so on, but I still, I still think the lessons remain for there. may even have some relevance to the North Island as well. We had a superb amount of information because we've been a uh, we've been with Chris Mulvaney in the Stock Care Program for uh, 15 or 20 years. So we know a hell of a lot about uh, what's going on with our livestock. And what that's told us is that we have a really destructive pattern of body weight and condition loss at critical times a year. We put it on and we lose it. We put it on and we lose it. The problem is when we have to put it on, we tend to use uh, feed that's been allocated, that should be allocated to finishing. Um, young stock. 
We also knew there was a really uncomfortable fit between our feed supply and our feed demand, and that's the nature uh, of long winters uh, in, in the hill and high country. But we didn't really have any quality information that would quantify that, and if we wanted it, um, and we needed it because we used tarmac um, most successfully, if we wanted that information, we had to gather it ourselves. So here you are, um, just one of the pasture cages. This is uh, from a typ typically brown top dominant, dominant pasture. So what did this recording stuff tell us? Um, well, in spring, it grows too little when we really need it. In summer, it grows too much when we don't really want it. And in autumn and winter, it becomes so damned undigestible, um, we can't use it. And that's no secret. That's a pretty... That's a pretty uh, typical scenario for most people that live in the hills. So let's sort of look at some of the uh, some of the stuff that we uh, information that we generated. And here's the annual production of three different pasture types at home. We're looking at ryegrass, which is typically on our bottom flats and so on, uh, and that's doing nearly 12,000 kilograms of dry matter between 11 and 12. We know that was reasonably accurate because um, next door, right next door, we have a dairy farm that does. Um, um, pasture measurements every 10 days, and we were within a bull's roar of that. Uh, our improved hill country, just a little under 6,000 kilograms for the year, and uh, you can see trailing at the, at the um, back of the field is unimproved hill at 3,700. But don't lose sight of how important that unimproved hill is to us, because you can imagine, uh, because it's such a big area, uh, slight changes there make huge difference overall to the feed supply. So let's zero in from this bigger picture um, to early spring production because this is the really critical time of year for us when we're going to set stock uh, out on the hill and uh, you know we're, we're really hanging out for the spring to kick in. So uh, have a look at it here. Um, ryegrass passes back on the home paddocks are doing 2,700. Uh, our overshine top rest hill, eight, just over 800, and our unimproved hill country is doing 252. Pretty bloody tragic. And how, what, what does that translate to? That translates to about sort of five, six, seven, eight kilograms of dry matter per day. So let's look at the, the uh, implications of that. Let's concentrate on this early spring, which is the one with the circle around it. Now, I'm putting out a couple of ewes, and they require about three kilograms of dry, dry matter a day. So that's about six. So I should be safe. I'm putting them out because it's growing, it's, it's growing about eight. But it's not that simple. Uh, let's have a look at a typical hill on a high country pasture. Um, you'll see what happens when an animal has a, has a pee on it. But look at the stuff in between. That's been growing for the entire spring up to the 15th of October. And the unfortunate thing is that we don't have a big wedge of feed on Southland Farm here. You'd probably try and get, uh, produce about 2,500, have about 2,500 kilograms of available feed in a paddock when you put your ewes out. We don't have that. We have what you can see there, which is probably two or three hundred. Um, but the real problem about that uh, is that you're asking your ewes to graze that ground and get enough feed from it, and it's only growing at six kilograms a day or eight kilograms a day, to get enough feed. She has to graze the equivalent of about half a hectare per day. It's an absolute physical impossibility. It just doesn't happen. So let's, let, and that's, that's the best controlled parts of our blocks. But a hell of a lot of it's like this, and you'll see our cows here grazing through the window, and you'll see there's an absolute mess of, of stuff there. Uh, and contrary to the previous speaker who was talking about North Island, in the North Island, that stuff decomposes over the winter. Uh, where we are, it's in the fridge and it just stays that way right through to the next spring. And it overhangs everything that's going to be grazing there. So I took a bit of that uh, pasture and I removed the, and this is I don't know, late October, so I removed that rubbish that hasn't been eaten by the cows. And you see the spring growth is there, it's great. 
but it's simply not available. And putting ewes out at that time of year is a bit like throwing a handful of Smarties um, sprinkles hundreds and thousands on the shag pile carpet and telling your kids to help themselves. <laughs> so let's look, uh, we're just talking about quantity at the moment, let's look at the quality uh, and you'll see we, we had that stuff analysed by Lincoln. Yeah, in the summer it was okay, um, quite surprisingly. Um, you know, if you keep it trim, brown top's not too bad. Uh, achieved 10.8, um, 9.3, 10.8. But outside the cage, look at it. Summer at 7.3, and autumn it's 5.8. I didn't want to get tested in winter, I was too scared. But look at it, 88% dead uh, and 34% digestible. So we don't have enough cows to clean this stuff up. And simply, even if we did have enough cows, they just fall to pieces because Look at, look at your uh, grazing. I mean, some, some wag said to me, John, if you've got some spates bear cartons, throw them out, they'll be better feed. So, what, so what's happening? Uh, Chris Mulvaney calls it the hungry, skinny ewe syndrome. So this ewe, uh, and she may, she may have one or two lambs, uh, has to graze a really big area. She simply spends too much, too much energy uh, on doing that and in the process she may well get mismothered and lose her lamb, but she simply um, is not going to make a decent living. So let's look uh, at, at this scenario again here. So we're talking about in this early stage, um, she can't make a living out of this grass, so what does she do? She relies on her body weight, so year after year, she drops a condition score, maybe 8 or 10 or 12 kilograms of dry matter. And that's absolutely catastrophic for her, for her uh, lactation. It's, it's extremely difficult for her in terms of you know, deaths of lambs, deaths of ewes, all those sort of things. And at some stage later on, uh, we're, going, we're going to have to put that weight back on. Um, so... Yeah, here we are again. Um, there's, you'll see the light blue. That's her requirement, and that's carrying right on uh, through the year. But you'll see the, the green stuff above it uh, is, uh, is the surplus. And that's the surplus that carries on year after year. It just echoes, and that's the stuff that stays ahead of those cows. So the only way to break the cycle is to have enough quality feed available in the spring so that we've got sufficient animals to control the pasture later on when it occurs. So let's look at the legumes. Um, and here it is, some pretty astonishing stuff, that our red clover, our loose, and more recently our Caucasian, are a country mile ahead of our traditional ryegrass pastures. Let's look at it in early spring, and you'll hear, see here, that's for this, up to the 15th of October, legumes doing uh, five, over 5,000 five and a half thousand kilograms of dry matter. The grass next door is on the dairy farm next door, urea assisted. So in other words, the legumes at Inverary are doing double urea assisted legu uh, ryegrass pastures um, on the farm next door. So in real life, you can see in mid-August, the difference between a legume pasture, this is stuck up like a solar panel, and the, and the soil of origin next door. Same aspect, same fertility, uh, just different species. So let's look at the production. On the red clover plantain for that period of time, it did four and a half thousand kilograms of dry matter. On the brown top sweet vernal, 230 kilograms. And that's the nub of the problem that we're talking about. So how do we embed this stuff in our system? Um, this, is, uh, this is the total for the full spring uh, here. Of, uh, of the legume and see next door the adjacent dairy farm. It's mind-bogging stuff. I was taught at Lincoln uh, that watch out for le lucerne legumes because you, you know, you're going to have to sort of fill in the shoulders of the season. Well, certainly not spring in our experience. So we've gone for satellite development. You'll see here putting stuff out uh, in the blocks and you'll see here spray and delay. Um, the sort of results we're getting um, Pasture of origin, about 3,500 kilograms. 
dry matter. I'm not talking about quality, I'm just talking about dry matter. And next door, uh, on that same place a couple of years later, nearly 15,000. So very quickly, just summing up, also the legacy effects of legume pastures. They, uh, people are worried that they don't last long. Well, we put a, we put a stitch in a bit of short rotation ryegrass here, and you'll see the results. Nine, the first three figures are straight legumes, and then putting in uh, short rotation ryegrass. Absolutely astonishing. That's a maize yield for you. Um, I don't know. That's a one-off. We, ha we haven't repeated it, but it gives you some indication. Okay, so... Um, and what, what that means is that for triple ryegrass pasture, they're going to do about 12,000. On average, if we double that, if we repeat that um, rotation of three and two, we're going to average about 18,000. So um, what's it doing for us? Uh, pretty good. Scanning has gone from 150 to 175. And lamb waste has gone from 25 down to 15. And so I say to farmers that come to our pace, um, don't actually um, expect a recipe here, but just be aware that somewhere, sometime, legumes are going to be a really important part of your business. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, and we look forward to, to more research which is done in the space of satellite farming throughout New Zealand, particularly its impact on New Zealand hill and high country and what the opportunity could be for other farmers in this space.